Well, from there, he steps into what we call chapter 2, and I would call these commands that he's about to give here, the first one, a courage to be strong. Look at what he says in verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy, have the courage to be strong. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He gives it to you. He gives it in overwhelming abundance, an overflowing abundance. Timothy, live in that. Savor that. He can carry you along. God's grace is sufficient. I can't remember if it's in a different verse or in something I heard, but but the verse goes something like this, that the grace that God gives you is sufficient for that day. And then the next day, he gives you grace that is sufficient for that day. Timothy, live in the grace that God gives you and have the courage to be strong. The next command he gives is in verse 2, which I call the courage to pass it on. I just read that for you for a moment, but let me, let me give it to you again. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Timothy, you've got to trust some faithful people in yours also. Give them this truth, to give them this purpose, to give them this message, and let them pass it on to others. When I read that verse, I thought of being in track and field and relay race. If you've ever run a relay race and you have this metal baton, or some of them are plastic, and there are four runners who are put at strategic places around that track, we'll say a four by 100 meter race. So one person on one end, on the back side, on the far corner, and the person who starts the race. How does that work? What happens is the first guy has the baton, the gun sounds off, and away he goes as fast, or he, or, or she, runs as fast as they can, they get around that first corner, they reach out, the person in front of them reaches back, they slap it into their hand, and that runner takes off as fast as he or she can go. What happens to that first runner? The first runner slows down and steps off the track. This is what Paul is saying here. He says, Timothy, you're carrying the baton. You're tight. You're weary. Don't be fast. I want you to take the baton of what you're sharing, pass it on to someone else who can pass it on to someone else. And you can step back and you can watch what's happening in in great faithfulness, that you can empower people, that you can equip people, that you can release people into service. Honestly, let's think about this. It takes courage to trust people. I'm a person who doesn't have a lot of trust at times when I should. You know, when I leave for Russia, I leave for two and a half or three weeks, I'm here. And so I I am the lead pastor of our church. And there's part of me that says, I don't think they can do it without me. I don't know if they'll do as good a job. They won't be as good at preaching. Or what if this situation comes up? Or what if this marriage explodes? Or what if there's this meeting and they didn't think of this? I'm a details person. I think of all these details. When I was leaving, Pastor Ben is our associate pastor. Pastor Dave works with some rural churches and with us. And there was part of me that said, I'm leaving. You guys will do great. I don't have any doubts. I don't have any reservations about you. You will serve and you will serve well. But you know what that takes? That takes trust. Sometimes we get caught up in the notion that our particular generation, we're so unique. And we're, we're going to get it so right, unlike any other generation. Honestly, the previous generation passes it to us. We pass it to the next generation. The same thing is with things that we learn about our faith. That we need to learn to equip people. I'm not sure what's happening here in this country in terms of church ministry, but I see a shift taking place in America. For most of the 20th century, especially the last half of the 20th century, churches focused on programs. Programs for the children, programs for the youth, programs for uh, recovery programs, all kinds of different programs, and they had great fruit. But as the 21st century has begun, and and your generation, the young folks like you, have come to the forefront, they're saying, "Uh, we don't like the programs anymore. We're too busy for that. So what we've had to do as a church is begin to shift how we do what we do. The message stays the same. 
but the methods change. We are called to equip people for service in the kingdom of God. We are called to make disciples. We are, we are called to help move them into greater levels of maturity. And our methods are changing. For those of you here who are younger people and who will be future leaders of the church, keep the message the same. But in your culture, in the way that you pursue life in your church or in relationships with other people, the methods can change, but always keep the gospel the center. Timothy, with all that's happening here in you and around you, you've got to pass it on. It may not look the same as when you did it, but as long as the message is intact, we can do this. Well, there's another section on um, courage, and in verses 3 to 6, I call it the courage to joyfully endure. When Paul gives to Timothy several examples, in verse 3, he says this, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So he uses three pictures to convey this message of sharing in suffering or courage. So the first one is that of a soldier. When I think of a soldier, I think of a, a person who is dedicated to one thing. Whatever his commanding officer says that he is supposed to do, he does it. Yes, sir. He doesn't question him. He simply follows the orders that have been given to him, and he follows them flawlessly. He is very focused. He is not distracted by a lot of things. He serves. In fact, look at verse 4. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. I serve at the call of my captain, my sergeant, my general. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do that. But when I signed on to serve, I serve you, sir. I am at your disposal to do what you have asked me to do. The problem that I've mentioned several times in these lessons is that in our 21st century, we have tried to do so much. Even myself, I have this problem as a pastor of our church. I have to try to do this activity and this activity and this activity and this activity. And sometimes I just have to step back and say, why did I say yes to all of those things? That when we're a follower of Jesus Christ and we are a caretaker of his church, we have to narrow the focus of what we do because it is always about the gospel. We're always passionate about that. That's example of a soldier. Verse 5, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Okay, so the soldier was focused. He narrowed the focus of what he did. He, he does. He says in verse 5, the athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Now, in the Roman world, there were three qualifications if you wanted to compete in athletic competitions. Number one, you had to be a Greek person. So to be in the Olympics, you had to be a, of the Greek nationality or heritage. Number two, you had to train a minimum of 10 months before you could run in a race. For most of a year, you would have to train, and you would run, and you would exercise, and you would do weight training. And you would do you know, cardiovascular skills and leg training skills, whatever your particular event for almost a year before you ever ran one race. And third, you had to run according to the rules. Imagine if a runner who was running a race around the track said, ah, I don't want to run all the way around. That's a long way around a 400-meter track. When I get to the bend over there, I'm going to cut across the infield and shorten my race. That, that runner would be disqualified. Paul says to Timothy, in the Christian life, Timothy, obedience, obedience, obedience. The things that Jesus Christ commanded us to do, we must do. He says that's the athlete. His third example is verse 6. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. I used to be a farmer. I understand that hard work. In the springtime, when you would get up very early before the sun came up and the days were long, and you'd work all day to put the crop in, you would come home late at night and you'd get a bite to eat and you'd just fall into bed because you were tired. And in the morning, you would get up very early and you do it all over again. You did it because of the love of the farm and the smell of the dirt and the opportunity to raise a crop and to see something grow. But he says, the farmer who works hard, he ought to have the first share of the crop. Timothy, you're working hard. I hope you can see the fruit of some of your labors. I hope that the problems can be corrected in these churches. But Timothy, you are working hard. The soldier has a single-minded purpose. The athlete obeys the rules. The farmer works hard. All of those are true of the Christian servant and of the Christian leader. 
How do I joyfully endure? I do that when I have a single purpose, when I obey what God has called me to obey, and when I learn to work hard within the mission that he's given me. He concludes this section in verse 7 with a very simple admonition. He says this, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Timothy, think. Think about it. He says, I know a lot of the things that I've asked you, a lot of the things that you're processing, you're saying, I don't understand. I don't know what to do. Paul, you are so strong and you seem to always have the right answer. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Does Timothy think about it? One of the problems that we have in our current culture is because of so many distractions and so many opportunities, so much technology, is we don't have time to think. I think of when I get up in the morning and I, I, I go take a shower in the morning, I turn on the radio so I can listen to the news and the weather and the sports so I know what's happening in the world. On my way, I, I, I drive to church in my car. I turn on the radio and listen to a little music or something more about the news. Then at the end of the day, when I'm tired and I come home, I like to sit on the couch and turn on the television or, or listen to some music. That what we have done, especially in our Western world, is we have crowded out the opportunity to just stop and think. And when we do have time to think, our minds have become so undisciplined, we don't know how to keep our minds focused in a certain direction. I think of times when Trudy and I have been very busy and we haven't had any time for each other. And so finally we'll sit down on the, in our living room or on a chair and we'll say, um, it's been a long time since we've talked. What would you like to talk about? And I'll say, I don't know. What do you want to talk about? And she'll say, I don't know. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> that when distance and distraction happens, it takes even more work to bring it back. So he says, Timothy, think about the things that I've said to you. If I sum up this whole section, I go back through the different commands. Says, Timothy, I want you to have the courage to stay. Timothy, I want you to have the courage to be strong. Timothy, I want you to have the courage to be able to pass it on to faithful people. Timothy, I want you to have the courage to joyfully endure like the soldier, like the athlete like the farmer. Timothy, I want you to have the courage to, to take time to think. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. It's a very interesting world in which we live, and courage is sometimes very hard to find. Sacrifices made, opportunities passed, opportunities taken. There's something that I do in the, in the fall and winter months that I do because of the gospel and because of something I enjoy. I told you that I like to play basketball. I still do. Two mornings a week, a group of us men get up. At, we start playing basketball at 6.30 in the morning. So at 5.55, my alarm clock goes off and I go, I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to run down a basketball court and go back and forth. But the two things occur to me. I love this game and I want to be with these people. There aren't very many people who play basketball with me in those early mornings who are followers of Christ. I don't go out there in the basketball court and I don't take my Bible and say, well, let me give you a sermon today. I don't say that at all. What I do is I let my character speak for me. There are times when I get angry and I say, I can't say anything right now. And so I, I, I endure for the sake of Christ. So the next, the, the two days later, and the early morning comes, and the alarm clock goes off again, and I say, Lord, give me strength. Give me joy. Allow me to play the game, not great, but well enough that my life my play is a testimony to the greatness of Christ. And I don't know, maybe one day one of these men will say, I know you're a pastor. We all know that. Everybody knows that I'm a pastor. But can I talk to you as a friend? I'm going through this struggle. I'm going through this difficult time. Could, could we talk? Could we have breakfast together? And I'll say, absolutely. But because I had the courage to put into practice the gifts that God has given me, the things that I enjoy, God says, I can use that for my glory. 
I want you to think about the things that you enjoy. Recreation, activity, education, relationship. Could God use that if you had the courage to do that in a gospel-oriented way? Well, I have so much fear. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't do it right, or maybe they would be embarrassed, or I would be embarrassed, or I, they'd be ashamed of me. Jesus Christ gives you the courage to do what he calls you to do. What would that be? We wrap up this section, chapter 2, verse 7. When we come back together tomorrow, we'll start with chapter 2, verse 8, and continue on this very personal, very intimate letter that Paul writes to Timothy. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift 